neat. This story was told me by my grandmother, Grandma Smith, good old Grandma Smith. She's 97, lives in Springfield. She told me this story when I was about five years old, growing up in Lahanda. Um, it's the main thing I remember about Lahanda is this story and the smell of the sugar beet factory at Swink, about 10 miles away from Lahanda. It's Grandma Smith gave me as uh, much help in being a writer as this teacher that I met at the University of Oregon. She taught me rhythms. And as you listen to the story, you'll hear these little Ozark rhythms that come from not having TV and not having a radio and not having much money, but having a real good grandma that could keep you from getting into too much trouble at night. She was a good, good woman. And she taught me this. It was, a <laughs> it was a little game that she would play with all the grandkids. It was called a hand game, and you put your hands out, all the kids put their hands on the table, and she'd go counting on all the fingers of the kids going in a circle, like this. William, William, Trimble Toes, he's a good fisherman, catches him. Some lay eggs, some none. One, two, three, four, wire, liar, limber, lock. Three geese in a flock. One flew east, a one flew west, a one flew over the cuckoo's nest. O-U-T spells out, you dirty dish rag, you go out. And she'd turn that finger under. And whoever had a finger left up last won the game. And this is dedicated to that good grandma. The name of the story is Little Tricker the Squirrel meets Big Double the Bear. Don't tell me. You're the only youngsters never heard tell of the time the bear came to the topple's bottom. Why, he was a huge high country bear. And not only huge, but horrible huge. And hairy, and hateful, and hungry. Why, he almost ate up the entire bottom before Tricker finally cut him down to size. Just you listen and see if he didn't. It was a fine fall morning, early and cold and sweet as cider. Down in the bottom, the only one up and about was old Papa's son and him just barely. 
hanging in the low limbs of the crabapple trees was still some of those strings of daybreak fog called hate hair by them that believes in such. The night shifts and the day shifts were shifting very slow. The crickets hadn't put away their fiddles yet. The spiders hadn't shook the dew out of their webs yet. The birds hadn't quite woke up and the bats hadn't quite gone to sleep. Nothing was a move except one finger of sun slipping soft up the knobby trunk of the hazel. It was one of the prettiest times of the day at one of the prettiest times of the year, and all the bottom folk were content to let it come about quiet and slow and savory. Tricker the squirrel, he was awake, but he wasn't about. He was lazying in the highest hole in his cottonwood high-rise with just his nose poking out from his pillow of a tail. And he was dreaming about flying. Every now and again, he would twinkle one bright eye out through his puffy pillow hair to check the hazel tree way down below to see if any of the nuts was ready for reaping. He had to admit they were all pretty near prime. All day yesterday, he had watched those nuts turning softly browner and browner and come sundown he had judged him to be just one day short of perfect. And that means if I don't get them today, tomorrow they're very apt to be just one day past perfect. And so he was promising himself just as quick as that sunbeam touches that first hazelnut, I'll get right down on the job. And then after a couple of winks, just as quick as that sunbeam touches the second hazelnut, I'll zip right down with my tote sack and I'll go to gathering, and so forth. Merrily dozing and dallying and savoring the sweet, still air. The hazelnuts get browner. The sunbeam inches silently on to the 15th and the 20th. But the morning was simply so pretty and the air hanging so dreamy and still, he hated to break the peace. Well then, the finger just about touches the 27th hazelnut when a holy dead blame gush almighty roar came kabooming through the bottom like a freight drove by the devil himself or at least his next hottest hollerer. Oh, what a roar! Ooh, 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 and not just loud and long, but high and low and chilling and fiery all to once. The hay hair and the spider webs all froze stiff. It was that chilling, whilst the springs boiled dry and the crab apples burned black from the hell heat of it. Even way up in Tricker's tall, tall tree, the cottonwood leaves turn brown and look ready to fall, still weeks before their time. Moreover, that roar had startled Tricker out of his snooze so sudden that he stuck startled, halfway between the ceiling and the floor, and he hung there, petrified, spraddle eagle, spellbound, stiff in mid-air, with eyes big as biscuits, and every hair stabbing straight out from him like the quills on a puffed-up porcupine. What in the name of 60 cyclones was that? He asks himself in a quakering voice, 
A dream gone nightmare? He pinches his nose to check. The spellbind busts, and Tricker drops hard to the floor. Hmm, he puzzles. Rubbing his nose and his knees, it is. Like a dream with a little nightmare noise thrown in. Like a plain old floating and flying dream dream, except when you get real bumps, it must be a real floor. And right then, it cut loose again. <laughs> Shaking the cottonwood from root to crown till a critter could hardly stand. Tricker crawls cautious across the floor on his sore knees and very, very cautious sticks his sore nose out and very, very, very cautious cranes over to look way down into the clearing below. Again, I says, The sound made Tricker's ears ring and his blood curdle, and the sight he saw made him wonder if he wasn't still dreaming, bumps or no. I'm big double from the high wild ridges, and I'm double bad, and I'm double big, and I'm double, double hungry. It was a bear, a grizzly bear. So big and hairy and horrible, it looked like the two biggest, baddest bears in the Ozarks had teamed up to make one. Again, I says, hungry, and I don't mean lunchtime, snack time, little time hungry. I mean big, grouchy, big, grumpy, bedtime hungry. I live big, I sleep big, and when I hit the hay tonight, I got six months before breakfast, so I need a supper the size of my sleep. I need a big belly full of fuel and lay by a fat to fire my full-time furnace and stoke my six-month snore a roar. When the bear opened his mouth, his teeth looked like stalactites in a cavern. When his tummy rumbled, it sounded like thunder in the faraway hills. And when he swung his head around, his eyes looked like a double-barreled shotgun shooting, shooting stars. I ate the high hills bare as a bone and the foothills raw as a rock. And now I'm going to eat the whole bottom and everybody in it all and with that gives another awful roar and raises his paws high above his head, stretching till his toenails strain out like so many shiny, sharp hay hucks, and then rails down, sinking them claws clean out of sight into the ground, and with an evil snarl, tears the very earth wide open like it was so much wrapping paper on his birthday present. In the sundered earth, there was Charlie Charles the woodchuck. His bedroom split half in two. His bedstead busted beneath him, and his bedspread pulled up to his quivering chin. Hey, you, Charlie demands in the bravest of voices the little fella can muster. This is my hole. What are you doing breaking into my home and hole? Well, I'm big double from the high wild holler, son bear snarls, and I'm loading up the old larder for one of my double long winter naps. Well, just you go lighting up somewhere else, you high hills holler, Charlie snarls back. This ain't your neck of the woods. Son, when I'm hungry, it's all big doubles neck of the woods, says the bear, and I'm hungry. I ate the high heels raw and the foot heels bare, and now I'm going to eat you up. Now run, says the woodchuck, glaring his most glittering glare. I can run too, says the bear, glaring back with a grin that turns poor Charlie's glitter to gloom. Charlie meets the bear's blistering stare for a couple of ticks more and then 
out across the other chairs and out across the bottom he springs, his ears laid low, his tail hoisted high.